Let's find common ground. I'm your host, Florian Platz, and I welcome you to this podcast with our guest, Andy Tudhope. Andy, please introduce yourself to us. Hi, Florian. It's great to be with you. I am somebody who cares deeply about public goods and the commons in general. I've spent a long time thinking about the kind of education that will help us craft careful cultures and communities capable of living together with just a little bit of grace. I believe I'm here to explore beauty with you, although we'll see where the conversation takes us. Indeed. Uh, I'm very excited to explore this topic with you. Uh, before we get to the topic of beauty, I want to start um, on the sort of common ground that we share, which is the fact that we're both active in the Web3 space. Um, and I think both uh, attached to the Ethereum community. So I would love uh, just as a sort of opening to understand um, how you got into this Web3 space, what Web3 is for you, and you know your activity in the space over the years. Yeah, I'm a great fan of inversion. I think it's at the roots of all great humor and a lot of great humanitarianism. And my story is mostly based around inversion because unlike most people, it was my father who introduced me to Bitcoin <laughs> rather than the other way around. He was a banker and knew about Bitcoin from very early on. And he told me about it in 2011 and I was still in college. And I told him that I hated accounting during school. I particularly hated tax, which is what he specialized in. I don't want to hear about any of this financial rubbish. I'm studying, you know, science and the humanities here. I want to become a teacher and he just, so, you know, keep your financial stuff to yourself. But, uh, you know, he's a wonderful person and a very persistent and persuasive guy. And he came back to me in 2014 and he offered me a, a Bitcoin, <laughs> you know, which wasn't worth much at the time. He said, I'll give you a Bitcoin to research this stuff. And seeing as I was just out of college and very poor, I was happy to take on that kind of thing, even though this seemed like hogwash to me. And the first people that I got involved with after searching around the internet were people who were trying not to get wealthy, but to redefine wealth. And that seemed interesting to me. And then when I dug deeper into what they were working on, which turned out to be, you know, the first legal papers around what we then called DCOs, decentralized collaborative organizations. I really like the focus on collaboration and I, I'm sad it's kind of gone away in favor of autonomy these days. But you know, when, when Dan Larimer was talking about DICs and so was Vitalik and uh, the people that I was working with were working on DCOs, it was the beginning of that recognition that perhaps a lot of this had to do with coordination and perhaps wealth could come to mean not how much you have, but simply having enough to share. That was a really radical shift uh, and something that I really resonated with. And so, uh, you know, I met a whole bunch of people in the early Bitcoin community doing vastly different things. Uh, and that fascinated me. I, you know, sort of chain smoking European anarchists and lawyers in Somalia, both very interested in the notion of Ricardian contracts for very different reasons. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I met uh, some, some of the programmers in particular, I, I found a South African not far from where I was staying at the time, a man called Simon de la Rivia, and, and we met in a bar in Cape Town to talk about the strange Canadian Russian kid and his proposal to like generalize Bitcoin or something. <laughs> uh, and we, we both thought it was crazy, but we were like, oh, well, you know, like, let's kind of see, let's kind of see where it goes. He got involved with consensus. I joined status, uh, you know, both of us were really interested in coming from, from Africa. We were really interested in how it might be possible to take these networks and ensure that you can participate meaningfully in them from your mobile phone in ways that didn't require fancy hardware and that didn't require a lot of data, you know, data in South Africa and across the developing world is exorbitantly expensive. And so I joined status, uh, to try and work on light clients and to try and 
get Ethereum working on resource restricted devices in general. You know, we made a lot of progress, but of course the network grew much faster than our own intelligence, which is, I hope, a feature of this conversation too. You know, the work on the light Ethereum subclients and later versions of Whisper and this kind of stuff taught us a lot, but uh, it couldn't keep pace with the, the rate at which the network was growing. And that over many years then led me, while others went deeper on the technical aspects of research in terms of proof of stake and how sharding or proto dank sharding or you know whichever eip we want to go after these days might make the original dream of resource restricted devices meaningfully participating in the network real uh, I, I decided to go and really explore what it might mean to craft a careful kind of culture which would be capable of using this technology in meaningful and valuable ways in ways that led us towards collective wisdom rather than corporate extraction. That has been what I've been doing for a number of years now, while some much smarter people, thank God, have been working on shipping ETH to getting us somewhat closer to that original vision. That is a beautiful answer that you're giving because it anticipates, I think, a lot of the things we're going to touch upon in this conversation. But also, um, I realized that we share even more than I originally thought. Um, I know Simon de la Rouvier as well from these early days and was very much inspired by his work on uh, decentralized organizations, uh, DCOs, as you call them. He was writing a book at the time, uh, sort of on GitHub publicly, and I was contributing to it just through leaving comments uh, on the GitHub issues and sort of discussing it on Twitter. Uh, I also remember him meeting him in uh, in Kenya, um, I think in 2016. I don't know, maybe you were actually also there. That's totally possible. I don't know. I don't remember meeting you there, but Simon was there and some other people. Vitalik, sort of early days of Ethereum back then. That was, that was really nice. Since we have so much in common there, um, what surprised you the most um, about, you know, where this ecosystem has actually gone in terms of how it developed versus the expectation you had back then. Is there some major element that is different than you expected or did everything go sort of as planned from your perspective? The great joy of it for me in the early days was that it wasn't all that planned. And I think <laughs> that if I can say it, the most surprising element for me has been precisely that fact of having no central planning division has turned out to be such a great feature. Uh, you know, like if the, this manifests in various different ways, some of which are more healthy than others, it's never just one thing. But, you know, if you remember back to the early days, the foundation was really deeply criticized for never doing anything. And out of that has grown this incredibly beautiful and really rather profound philosophy of subtraction, Kaizen and long-term thinking, which has proven to be enormously mm -hmm. beneficial. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't know if you remember back in like 2015 and 2016, you're sitting there with the war chest and everybody's like, ah, the foundation, you're not doing anything. You're not funding anyone. You're not doing, and it's all just Joe Lubin and the consensus people building the infrastructure and you assholes are just sitting there doing nothing. And there's an element of truth to that, but also how it has played out has been really interesting to see. And I think that we're, we're seeing that same, there's this old concept in a lot of Asian thoughts about right people, right time, harmonious conditions. And I often have that sense about Ethereum because there was never this great corporate vision and there was never a single company pushing it forward. There were individuals doing interesting and necessary things along the way, but the lack of a really good marketing team, the lack of a coherent narrative, the lack of a singular focus which at times has seemed to pull it apart and make it really illegible and make it seem as if it is acting against itself has in many ways, and I think will continue to prove itself to be unique and really at the heart of what makes this particular version of what is becoming an increasingly generalized technology truly interesting. And that's been fascinating to see, right? It's contrary to all expectations. If you read anything from ordinary management and consulting textbooks to things about the tyranny of structurelessness, you will find 
really coherent arguments against the possible success of something like Ethereum. <laughs> and yet here it is, you know, and that's, that's kind of fascinating to me more than anything, right? Not any particular aspect of the technology, which is surprising in and of itself. And again, has negative and positive things which have happened over the years, but this, it has it has like a slime mold really found its way through the labyrinth of corporate extraction, ideological capture, cynicism from various different and really rather important participants, defection from important teams who didn't get EIPs passed that they really wanted to, even though there was his stuff and yet, yet it continues. And yeah, it's just, it's fascinating to watch. You know? Interesting what you're saying, because I, I would agree with this perspective, yet today we see, for example, the SEC in the United States, the Securities uh, Exchange Commission, which regulates the financial markets in the US, claim that Ethereum, unlike Bitcoin, is actually a security in the meaning of the Howey test, meaning that it's a common enterprise. And they actually say the Ethereum Foundation does have a central planning role in in this whole undertaking of ethereum but what you're saying is they deliberately do not have this position and have actually benefited greatly the ethereum ecosystem by not trying to centralize all the planning what would be your answer to gary gensler and other people saying that ethereum is such a common enterprise why is it not it's a wonderful question isn't it uh because it gets us to the roots of the word common uh, which is really what the law is all about. You know, the law is an ass, right? And it's all about arguing about the particular meanings of words. And the Howey test is a wonderful example of exactly that. So what do we really mean by this word common? And in fact, when you look at the way that the Howey test is actually operationalized in the world today, you'll see that that first, there's four prongs, right? And that first one is that a common enterprise is almost always taken for granted because we're never not doing things in common, which I think is a really rather profound point when you take it outside of the narrow perspective of the legal world, that there's always, there's no such thing as an individual. <laughs> Truly, I mean, the latest biology proves that if you read any of the books about trees that have come out recently after, you know, braiding sweetgrass, the sprout lands by William Bright Logan, or the overstory by Richard Powers, amazing books, <laughs> no individuals anywhere that you look, always a common enterprise. So. It's interesting that that particular prong of the Howey test is kind of taken for granted these days. And then, you know, the other three expectation of profit based on the work of others, and speculative futures. I think that there are ways that, of course, Ethereum can be interpreted in that sense, right? And the Howey test is specifically very broad. It's designed like that for the protection of people. Not expecting a legal answer from you. But, yeah. yeah no, um... no, no, no. Yeah. My, my perspective sure. here is that, you know, like when, when you have the kind of like open and decentralized approach to things, one of the most powerful ways to work is not via ideological resistance, right? It's via collaborative dialogue. And what I've been pointing at in terms of like you know, EIP 999 and parody or like a lot of the stuff that happened with Vlad in the early days, these kinds of things have been like moments of exogenous shock in the ecosystem. And yet in the long run, they really strengthen both the individual participants in their own like stance and being in the world, but also like the network as it is realized between all the participants. And so the same thing is true of any criticism by regulatory bodies or the SEC or stuff. You know, I don't think that these should be dismissed out of hand for ideological reasons. I think that one needs to understand the route from which they comes and then illustrate in this particular case, how the instantiation of law in a system like Ethereum is a radical improvement over the kinds of protection that the regulation, which is being used like the Howey test can offer as protection to ordinary consumers, right? Cause that's really like, you go to regulators and they drop their public or professional facade. These are often well-intentioned, well-meaning people who are genuinely looking to protect what they see as the public interest. And this has been like the fascinating thing for me over the years, right? Is that like, I got involved, as I say, out of college, I was, you know, ideological in the extreme and keen to burn it all. Right? 
I was with the European chain snarking anarchists. I was like, yeah, let's put jurisdictions on chain, compete for citizens. Uh, you know, let's do the whole thing and forget nation states on this stuff. And it has been fascinating to spend years, you know, educating bankers, being involved with lots of different people from lots of different walks of life with radically different perspectives. And to see that, you know, a lot of the people that I had kind of automatically set myself against by virtue of a particular ideological position are not in and of themselves bad people. What we want to achieve with Ethereum, which is global collaboration based on meaningful incentive structures that direct value to the people actually doing work, then we need everyone, right? And, and that doesn't mean that we have to compromise with anyone in like that kind of horse trading sense, but it does mean, you know, like even in the, the IETF in that early 1992 document, you have this distinction drawn between like compromise as in horse trading and compromise as in technical trade-offs. The technical trade-offs is really good and necessary. The horse trading between people is bad. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I, I see these kinds of conversations with regulators and that as means of trying to find the technical compromises necessary to include more and more people, to invite them into a different way of perceiving regulation a different way of perceiving what the law is and how it is enacted, right? Not enforced, enacted by virtue of free choice, right? That this is the thing on Ethereum, even in the early days, you know, Mikhail and all of these people were writing about it, that law on Ethereum is opt in. I can choose to use a contract or not. And once I do, it's deterministic. The, the contract will do exactly what it says, even if what it it says in code is not what people say about it in natural language. It will do exactly what it says in code, but it's up to him, right? And, and, and so there's this really deep insight that is generated from systems like this, which is that like in the current legal system, what we do is we enshrine some constitutional ideal and then we implement error handling around it. So we say we love free speech, right? Everybody should be able to say what they want, except if it's like defamation, right? And then we have particular definitions of defamation per quad or per se. And we, we enshrine legal rules, which are then interpreted by other human beings as to whether like what you've said falls within free speech or whether it qualifies as defamation of one kind or another. We can do radically different things in like digital executable environments like Ethereum, which is to say that we can implement costs upfront. So you, you know, you don't just enshrine some good and then implement error handling. You say what it costs to speak in particular kinds of ways on Ethereum. So the most classic example of this is like, it's very, very expensive to store data on Ethereum because everybody has to store it all of the time. And so we assign a particular gas cost to the S store opcode. And that in, in order to speak meaningfully in this particular manner, it has a specific cost associated with it. And what we try and do rather than enshrining some good and then implementing error handling is we say, well, what is the cost to everyone for particular kinds of behavior? And can we ensure that that cost is provably more to the speaker than everybody who has to listen to them when they act in ways which we collectively and publicly and verifiably define as malicious? It's like a, it's just a very, very different system. And what it leads us to is not the need to have these you know, raft of laws which supposedly protect consumers like KYC and AML and all of this stuff. But what they actually do is make all of our lives as law-abiding citizens a bureaucratic mess without having any impact on criminal activity. And they reverse that, right? Such that if you want to like abide by the rules of the system, it's provably less expensive than breaking the rules of the system. And that's all it is, right? It's an economic. Rather than enforcement with the threat of nation state level violence, you just have economic cost models that implement and enact the different kinds of laws that people can choose for themselves. This is a radically different way to think about, you know, protection and regulation, and it requires other kinds of protection, which are mostly premised in education. When the regulator's jobs become more about education and less about force, then that's a wonderful thing. That's truly amazing. It's such an, it's such an opportunity for Larry. You'd be like, Larry, you know, you don't have to force people anymore. You can just teach them. How do you feel about that, man? You know, <laughs> I don't know if he would really go for it, but that's, that's kind of maybe what I would say. Yeah. <laughs>
That's an interesting answer. So maybe uh, a last question on this on this nation state thing. Um, the the United States is currently really squeezing the crypto sector. Uh, the Signature Bank was closed down supposedly because it was serving mostly crypto clients. Silicon Valley Bank went bust. Silvergate went bust. So there seems to be really a sort of enforcement on some, some sort of almost conspiracy uh, seeming level at the moment in the United States. You yourself are based in Africa and you've seen this ecosystem uh, develop over the last few years. Um, I even just uh, recently learned that I think Vitalik spent quite some time recently uh, visiting different African countries. Do you think that Africa or various nations in Africa will play an important role in this regard for the development of the crypto ecosystem? Can they offer a better home uh, for these systems to freely develop and try out these alternative ways? Do, do you see value there and, and a future? Or do you think this is almost not relevant uh, for the development of this, of this crypto ecosystem or Web3? Yeah, Africa is such a big place. There's so much stuff going on here. There's so many different kinds of people, so many different countries, so many different perceptions, so many different regulatory regimes. Insofar as we are able to find ways to educate ourselves and build tools that are meaningful in local contexts that nevertheless connect to a global economy, then yes, absolutely. Whether we will find the kind of education that is most applicable, whether that will be allowed to flourish in contexts that are otherwise often quite draconian in the regulations that they impose or in their perception of, you know, what is allowed. These are all, you know, they're, they're such massive variables. So on a personal level, I have enormous hope. I think that as Africa goes, so the world does. But of course I think that because I'm African. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's, there's that aspect mm. of things. I, yeah, like on a personal level, I have enormous hope and I think that there is good reason to be optimistic, but who knows? It's this, you know, there's this old story that I really adore about a Chinese farmer you know, and the Chinese farmer has a little farm in a rice paddy in ancient rural China. And he has a little family, one son and a horse. Uh, and the horse runs away one day and all of the villagers come to him. They're like, ah, oh, we're so sorry your horse ran away. What a bad stroke of luck. And the, China, the other farmer says, well, maybe. <laughs> and then horse sickness comes to the whole town, kills everybody's horse. Uh, and his horse comes back from the mountains and everybody's like, ah, oh, your horse survived. What an enormous stroke of luck. It's like, ah, oh, maybe. <laughs> the horse has kind of gone wild in the meanwhile and his son takes it into the paddy to re-break it in. And the horse throws his son and his son breaks his leg. Everybody comes, oh, oh, we're so sorry. His son broke his leg. Now you can't work the fields. What a bad stroke of luck. Maybe. <laughs> then the army marches through this new campaign on the Western Front, you know, and they're recruiting all of the young men, but they can't take his son because his leg is broken. Everybody's like, ah, what a stroke of luck. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you see where this is going, right? It goes on and on and on. I won't, otherwise we'll be here for the whole podcast. The point being that I... <laughs> Beautiful story. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's such an enormous array of variables, right? And I think that mm. there are, as I say, there's good reasons to be really hopeful about Africa, particularly if we can get education done by Africans and Africans building solutions on Web3 for Africans. I think that that's enormously mm. promising. I think that if it's the same old story of like Western aid parachuted in and inevitably patronizing ways, then it only serves to amplify the power dynamics and the trauma of colonialism. So, you know, like both of these things remain possibilities and Web3 is not immune to the problems that we've seen in traditional aid sectors and in traditional finance, but it does hold still the promise for some kind of agency and self-fulfillment that is perhaps less possible using other kinds of technologies. What you just said is really inspiring, I think, uh, in terms of, you know, um, there is hope and uh, you're tremendously hopeful um, for what could happen in Africa and the role it could play, but that it's also important that it's, you know, um, solutions and education from Africans for Africans, that it's really their own genuine thing. 
I sort of want to steer the conversation a little bit into the direction of public goods, um, which is um, a topic that's widely debated at the moment in the Web3 space. Uh, a lot of people put their hope in this concept of public goods. Um, at the same time, um, just today, I read a thread by uh, Martin Koppelmann from uh, formerly Gnosis that he said, well, maybe actually public goods are not such a useful thing because uh, if something is a public good, at least in the old world, it's been treated pretty badly. Um, uh, you know, people exploiting the sea, the air and all these sorts of traditional public goods. Do you think the public good concept is a viable uh, idea that um, this, you know, Web3 ecosystem should be pursuing? Or do you think that it's sort of a misguided idea that will not lead to anything sort of substantial for the ecosystem? I'm going to keep doing this, uh, which is to say both, right? Because it depends on who has the idea and the manner in which they live it, embody it, enact it, embed it in their worlds, right? So the easiest definition of a public good is a good that is axiomatically for the benefit of others. Right? So we don't need to get into exclusive rivalries, blah, 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 blah. Right? It's just about like the axiom of this thing, the, the thing upon which it rests, you know, that, that thing itself is the benefit of others. Right? A very, very beautiful concept. And it's a very, very, very deep and powerful idea, right? That like your life is lived in service to that which is greater than you. You find this across all of the wisdom traditions. You find it in the most moving movies, pieces of music, literature, whatever, wherever you look, right? The notion that I can live as a service to life itself is enormous, right? And then in that particular frame of mind, if others' benefit is axiomatic in everything that I do, public goods is an interesting way of enacting that in the technological sphere, because even this so-called economic problem, right? Look at the language that we use, the problem of the of free riders, right? Free rider problem. Mm -hmm. Free riders are no longer a problem. They're the exact public you ought to be serving, right? This is why, this is why bhakti yoga, right? Devotional yoga, the, the, the path of service is so enormously difficult because it's like, go and help one person, right? Forget all of the stuff that people are out there, you know, they clamp onto the narrative. And so I say it can be used in negative ways because it has some kind of mimetic power at the moment. And so the narrative gets used to, you know, people's own exploitative ends, often in subtle and fairly subconscious or even unconscious ways. But bhakti yoga, right? Go and help just one person, see how impossible that is, right? To really help another person. Right, and that will gradually over time wear down your own projections onto the world about who you are as helper, about the particular power dynamics at play, all of this stuff, you know, because as soon as I'm in this place of I I can help you, the inherent power dynamic here is that I have and you lack. So nothing good can ever come of that. But if I recognize that what it really is deeply about at a fundamental level is the benefit of others, because the path of service leads to the recognition that the other is in me. I am the other. The light I see in another person's eyes is nothing different from the light in my own. This is the apogee of bhakti yoga, right? And so in that sense, there is hope, right? Again, there's, there's wonderful hope for, for public goods that are done by people who know what is truly good for the public because it's not different from themselves, right? And at first blush, that sounds enormously selfish, but you can only come to understand what's truly good for yourself if you're totally selfless. They go together, right? They're two sides of the same coin. They're inseparable. Instantiated as a culture, I think that it's an enormously powerful mode, right? It's an enormously powerful narrative when it is not just propagated by people who are using it for their own ends, but genuinely embodied by those who want to understand what is good, what is the good even, right? It holds enormous possibilities as that. And there's no arguments, right? Like, like there's nothing discursive that we can say in this podcast, which will convince people of this. The only thing that can happen is that people live it over and over and over again, right? Throughout all of 
time. Like mm. this is the thing, you know, with Ethereum, when you really begin to think about technologies like this and the time horizon over which they operate, that's when it starts to get really exciting in some way, right? A few years ago, Carl and Vitalik and Simon, who wrote this very beautiful blog not that long ago called Time as a Platform, uh, you know, began thinking about this problem in AI, which is known as Rocco's Basilisk, which is the really rather dark idea that a malevolent AGI, which may come into existence in the future, you're incentivized to bring it into existence now because it, you know, will benefit you once you bring it into existence, it, you know, it won't sort of torture and burn you like the rest of humanity. It'll just turn you into its pet, right? That's basically Rocco's Basilisk. So there's this like doom loop, the Basilisk eating its own tail of like, you're incentivized now to work on AGI because like when an AGI inevitably comes into the world, it will, be, it will reward you for having brought it into existence. And there's kind of no way out of that. The rationalist community, Eliza Yodkowsky and these folks have been kind of in some sense really shaken up by it. Um, and there's an answer in Ethereum, nowhere else in the world, right? I mean, AI is running rampant at the moment, but there's this notion of Ether's Phoenix, right? Which is the notion that public goods in the future will retroactively reward you for working on them now, right? It's the, the like this, this mm -hmm. notion of retroactive funding incentivizes us to leave strong traces on the chain right now as often as we can in as many different places as we can using protocols in good faith because we cannot right now understand what the rules of a future retroactive airdrop will be and so the incentive essentially is to use things in good faith because there's this possibility of a massive future reward for any one of these things right this is ethos phoenix this is how we bootstrap using time as a platform the kinds of incentive structures which lead to axiomatically benefiting others, right? And recognizing that there's no difference between self and other. It has to be lived, though. It has to be lived. And mm. that's the challenge before all of us, right? Is that mm. we have the technological tools and we have the concepts, we have the propositions, right? The propositional statements of, oh, okay, here's how we solve Rocco's Basilisk, here's how we create incentives across time using a kind of technology which can cast consciousness much further than books or any other previous medium can and think about how powerful books are right like i can go and read the musings of a mind more than two thousand years old and genuinely commune with that right some of my best friends lived two and a half thousand years ago or more right yeah. <laughs> blockchains expand that enormously they'll be around for an enormously long time and so the capacity that we have to really deeply reflect upon who are these others for whom we wish to do good, because it's not just you and I living right now, right? It's not even just seven generations ahead, the seven generations under the earth in Native American mythology and narratives. It's, it's much more than that, 700, right? Uh, it's like, Man, a lot of people to serve. <laughs> so it start with one, you know, see, see how difficult it is. See how nobody wants to, nobody wants your help anyway. Nobody wants to be saved by you. <laughs> and then, and then, you know, like that begins to, to embody, to embed and to enact this notion of good for others, which is also simultaneously good for me because there's no separation. You've mentioned this concept of beauty multiple times, and it's a very, you know, big term to use. And I think it has different meaning to many people. I um, actually stumbled upon this sort of extremely interesting meaning of beauty uh, when I was reading um, David Deutsch, um, a physicist who is trying to sort of give an interesting worldview um, about, uh, you know, synthesizing the most bleeding edge theories in biology, epistemology, physics, chemistry, different sort of sciences. And, um, he was using beauty as a concept to, uh, explain uh, why human consciousness is really, really special. Um, because he said, well, there's actually, you know, humans are the only known animals that find, uh, flowers beautiful. Uh, there's no other known animal that, you know, recognizes flowers 
as beautiful, he thinks that um, uh, uh, plants used this concept of beauty to actually establish a protocol of communication uh, with bees, which they need for reproduction. So uh, there's this really interesting connection between, um, you know, beauty potentially as a communication protocol. Um, I don't know, what is your sense and understanding of beauty and how does it play into your work? There's two different ways to go about this. And I, uh, I will try and walk them both simultaneously as soon as you mentioned David Deutsch and there's the atmosphere of some kind of quantum realm around us. So we'll do them simultaneously <laughs> if language will allow. The one is to say that, you know, I was lucky enough to be at college where a man called Frank Wilczek came to give a lecture and Frank won the Nobel Prize for his work on quantum chromodynamics. Q QED, quantum electrodynamics, mm -hmm. was developed by Richard Feynman and has to do with the electromagnetic force. QCD, quantum chromodynamics, has to do with the strong and weak nuclear forces. And it's chromo because we add these different property spaces instead of just charge and spin, you get three different colors, not because they're actually colors, but because physicists couldn't think of a better thing to call them. And Frank gave this incredible talk, which is about, uh, which is based on his book, A Beautiful Question, right? One of the most incredible physics books you will ever read in your life. It asks, does nature embody beautiful ideals, right? That is Frank's question. And it's quite stunning what he does in that book. One aspect of which, and one that relates to David Deutsch is, uh, you know, we have these different kinds of quarks, you know, up and down the rest of it, but one of the triplets is truth, beauty, and charm, sometimes called top, bottom, and, and charm, but truth, beauty, and charm, mm -hmm. that's really my uh, preference. And the point that Frank makes based on his work is that, you know, like what is a proton or what is an electron seen from the lens of subatomic particles, there's many different ways of speaking about these things, all of which are metaphorical, but from the lens of subatomic particles smaller than them, a proton and an electron are actually the same thing just in different states of internal motion, right? So it's like top, top, uh, truth, truth, beauty, and truth, beauty, beauty, right? Which means that they're exactly the same thing. They're just in the internal dance of the quarks is slightly different. So you're seeing the same thing, the one thing always, right? It's not separate, always just one thing, but in different states of internal motion, slightly different phases in space, if you might say. And I think that's really wonderful because it shows this, like, inseparability in essence between truth, beauty, and goodness, right? Which is something that the ancient Greeks were well aware of if you go and read, you know, even the pre-Socratic philosophers, but Socrates, Plato, and Plotinus in particular were big on this, as was Parmenides and others. The reason that this struck a particular note with me was because I had been working on updating or extending perhaps the notion of truth and beauty that had come to us from John Keats in English literature, right? So he writes this poem, Ode on the Grecian Urn. It says quite famously, truth is beauty, beauty, truth. And in order to back that statement up, he introduced a concept called negative capability, which is the ability to remain in uncertainty, mystery, or doubt without irritable reaching after fact or certainty. And I think that it's a wonderfully powerful mode right which can lead to the lived experience of beauty in so many different moments to be in contradiction and paradox to not irritably grasp after one side or the other but to appreciate the way that they interpenetrate right they're into being <laughs> one might say it's an amazingly wonderful way of looking at the world but there's something more than that which i think maybe you're sort of pointing at because it's still negative right literally just the word itself like ah we're kind of missing something in that particular realm. And so I was looking at the work of Toni Morrison mm. and some South African writers who write in a language radically different from Keats and from a context rad radically different to him, who use all sorts of strange call and response, oral techniques to write in the second person, present tense, all of this weird and wonderful stuff, because to try and fit the story of genuinely unbeautiful things like the middle passage into ordinary language is to disfigure it and to betray the reality of those experiences in ways which are unspeakable. So how do you, how do you create a monument, a memorial to the unbeautiful ways that we have lived with one another over the course of history and 
nevertheless draw out of it some kind of beautiful remembrance. That's really Morrison's project. And I called it positive capability because I'm also not an enormously creative guy. And positive capability is not just the ability to remain in uncertainty, mystery, or doubt. It is to live in uncertainty as a ruling principle, nevertheless grounding that in the community which always gives contradiction its meaning. There's, there's some very, very communal aspects to language. Language only means, words only mean what they do because we agree upon them. And there's some really deep contradiction in that. It's captured in African philosophy when it's like, umuntu gumuntu gabantu. A human being is only a human being through other human beings. You can be yourself, right? Real individuation, but you require others to do so. Same thing with positive capability. It's to assert contradiction as a ruling principle, which must and can only be interacted with communi communally in order to be meaningful, right? So contradiction is all around us. We are, the, it's the freedom of no escape from uncertainty, right? But in relationship, in truly relating to our own uncertainty, anxiety, and doubt, and in doing so with others in an honest and courageous fashion, we can find these moments like you do in Beloved where one character you know, offers up her own great heart and there is the celebration in a clearing. And, you know, it starts, women were dancing, men were sitting, children were playing, then women sat down and cried, and men stood up and danced and children screamed. And everything got confused and baby Suggs, this grandmother, offers up her own beautiful heart. And there is this moment of beauty beyond language that is nevertheless pointed to by the particular nature of the words which are grounded in this communal interaction with uncertainty that exceeds any of our individual capacities to really be human that for me then like grounds beauty in my work right like it's all about relationship it's all about the ways in which we relate to and with one another and the wider world of which we are a part which we also reflect wholly in every moment right a single dewdrop holds the whole sky and every star. The moon shines in every wave, no matter that it breaks endlessly. And there is this really important way in which how we do things is so much more important than what we actually do. Rather than focusing on any particular kind of content, any specific technical insights, I'm much more interested in how we are when we're doing things. You've written a book. I found it on the internet called um, The Blue Book, and you call it a proof of love. How is this connected to your understanding of beauty? And, uh, you know, what, what, what was your idea behind, behind writing this book? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Proof of love is a wonderfully youthful and idealistic statement, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I was so, I was so taken with proof of work and the way in which it enabled us to imagine different, different ways of relating, right? Uh, that I was like, what else, what else can we prove? You know, how, how, how far can we push this? What is the, the logical outcome of this way of thinking about the world? conceptualizing relationship and transaction, the ability to act across, literally. It's like, well, I mean, you know, I want to prove love. <laughs> Why not? Um, a sort of starry-eyed, romantic kid just out of college. You know, I, I sort of look back now on the absurdity of it, and it's, it's just, I can hear peals of laughter, right? Cosmic laughter uh, every time I, I think about it. But they're not mocking. Right. And, and this is because one of the profoundest things that I came across outside of the work on communal language and its link to contradiction and the lived understanding of beauty in relationship was this notion that the universal, right, so-called truth, capital T, is only accessible through the particular, right? Like if you set out to state the universal, to state the absolute truth, you will inevitably from your very first word be caught in the performative contradiction that you are limited, finite, and you do not know. 
doesn't matter how much you learn, doesn't matter the insights you have, the visionary experiences, the moments of meditation outside, it doesn't matter. It's all nothing in the grand scheme of things. So the only way, the only way to the universal is through your highly specific, particular and finite experience. And when that is rendered honestly and sincerely, as close to exactly as it was, as you can manage, right, as you can really look at yourself, then this magical translation occasionally occurs where somebody will read your highly specific and particular experience and they'll be like, ah, oh, this reminds me of this moment. And they'll interpret it in their own framework and they'll see it in their own way. They won't have the same experience that you do, but something of the universal will be present in that moment of encounter, right? It doesn't exist in the text itself. It doesn't exist in what I did. This is the insight across all of you. Don't worship the work of your own hands because it's, it's flawed, right? It's limited. You can't prove love. Love is what proves everything. Love is the love is right. Like that's it. That's all you can say about it. So the notion that you can even prove it is completely misguided in many ways. And yet there's something really almost magnetic in the attraction, right? To trying to do that, knowing that it, you know, is, is doomed to fail even from the first word and yet still setting out to have a go. And so that was all, you know, that was, that was all in my mind. And I was, you know, I'd, I'd studied a master's in, in English and part of it had been the book as object. I was in Oxford. We got to work on the original Gutenberg presses. I set my own poems with long metal, <laughs> you know, sort of type. I did the whole thing and I was deeply fascinated by the materiality of books. And I was thinking about, well, what does a truly digital book born on the internet actually look like and what are the affordances that it provides, which despite my deep love for the book as physical objects are not possible. And how can I use that to illustrate, hint at, make a finger pointing at the moon in ways that like the work itself will never be able to reach. And yet something about like the structure and its inevitable particularity and specificity will help open for, for other people. So yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a book of poems, which nobody really reads much anymore. And it's highly specific. You know, these are, these are things that, that almost every single poem in there is about something that I experienced some moments in my life. I, you know, looking back on it now, I kind of, like, this must be really rather boring for most people. <laughs> it's, it's just basically a journal of some dude on the internet in slightly poetic form, but it, it was an incredible experience for me to build it because it was premised on these ideas that had grown out of what I'd seen in some of the latest digital technologies and the ways in which they were leading us to a particular nature of relationship, particular kinds of transactions. And it was the beginning of what has been four years of work on what it means to instantiate ceremonial transactional space. Right? Like ceremony and ritual has been at the heart of beauty and human being since forever, since before language, right? Like dance and music was there a long time before, uh, like symbolic writing, certainly. And, uh, dance probably even before guttural phonemes. The question for us is if we do want this collaborative global computing surface, which incentivizes people to act in pro-social ways and directs the flow of value to people at the edges actually doing work. And we need to think very deeply about the kinds of institutions where institution means not bureaucracy, but custom and ritual that enables that at scale, right? And, and those institutions are ceremonial transactional spaces. And I don't mean it in some mystical sense. We host a KZG ceremony to get the kinds of parameters we need for really good data compression. We host powers of Tao ceremonies in order to create the private key we need to encrypt zero knowledge circuits, uh, in a way that is safe and doesn't produce like the toxic private key only on one person's machine. We do these ceremonies all the time, but like, how do we, how do we take that notion of the ceremonial even further into the very transactions that we share with one another. And while the blue book doesn't do that specifically, there are 
other versions of it. You know, I, I'm now I'm on the fifth, <laughs> and and the last one, which is called Finding the Blue Book, does exactly that. Each each chapter is stored as an HTML document in Rweave and then referenced in an NFT. The contracts uh, for which I adapted such that anybody can update the token URI because everybody's been like, ah, NFTs are only pointers to URIs. So I'm like, yeah. We can make an artistic thing out of that, right? So like here's an NFT that I give to people, which controls the HTML that gets displayed for each chapter in the book. And the guardian of that NFT can change the HTML that gets displayed because that is a means of making sure that any transaction in the context of this contract is simultaneously an economic action that costs gas to execute and an artistic statement. Right? If you like transfer the NFT, if you update the token URI, if you sell it to your friend, if you do nothing, all of these are artistic statements, right? So the book takes on this kind of infinitely combinatorial creative space, not just in terms of what is initially produced, but then in terms of how people choose to guard the chapter and the chapters that I give them, right? Uh, and mm. there's so much more, right? There's so much more you can do. Uh, but mm. that's that's kind of a large part of what is at the heart of, of you know, like, like what is the book as an object in this new kind of collaborative consensus backed global medium? Yeah. You know, the potential is endless. Mm. I, uh, want to uh, talk a little bit about, um, I think what you also mentioned a few times, this idea of communal language and the importance of community to actually become an individual, right? You need others to individuate. It's sort of this back and forth process. You're quite well known uh, by some people on the internet by uh, for having created or having been part of the creation of uh, a community called the Kernel Community. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what, you know, started this idea of creating such a community? And what is your goal with this community? Where do you think uh, this is going to go? And um, what of your learnings have you been successfully able to bring into the, you know, lived experience of these community of this particular community? Yeah, the simple story is that kernel is a gift. Uh, I had a wonderful friend who had a very profound educational experience in an extracurricular program at university. He wanted to replicate that for people in crypto because he was involved with funding public goods very early on, but recognized that we need good public goods to fund. <laughs> and so we need education at the top of the so-called funnel. He began that, but needed somebody to create the pedagogical model, the, what we would teach right, uh, in, in this particular course. And he asked me to do it. I was at a loose end at the time and had spent, you know, eight years, uh, kind of exploring, uh, this world <laughs> and had gathered an enormous amount of context and resources, but had never seen it all put together in one place. So I thought, you know, oh, it's, it's fine. Like a month or two, I'll put this all together for him and it will be a really nice gift for somebody that I care very deeply about. And of course it turned out, and this is like Bhakti yoga is always the thing is that it was ultimately a gift to myself because I got to see everything that I had encountered and learned from put into a coherent place for the first time. And I had done that a few on a few occasions, being very interested in these digital books. You know, I built a few by the time that I set out to build kernel. And yet this time, because of the nature of this friend, his name is Vivek, that I built it for, uh, you know, Vivek's great genius is not writing books, it's people and relationships. And the great thing that he recognized about that seminal program he went through at university was that while the pedagogy was really strong and the content that they learned was particularly moving and informative, it was really the fact that the program oriented each of the people toward one another, not the content that made it really meaningful and lasting. And so he did that with Colonel. And all of a sudden, here was this book that I'd written, you know, like the book, it was a lot of fun for me to write a very personal project. I don't think more than, you know, uh, a handful of people have ever read it. Um, and that's wonderful. I didn't 
I wrote it out of devotion, not for a target market, right? But it was very, very interesting to build a book that then all of a sudden people kind of gathered around and spoke back to. <laughs> and people were like, no, you're wrong about value. Or like, no, this is not what freedom is. Or, you know, all of these kind of very, very foundational concepts that we were trying to investigate together. And that was really the key for us, right? Even from the very beginning was that we never set out to provide singular answers precisely because I know all the stuff about positive capability, about community, about communal language, about where meaning really comes from. And so what we did from the very start was to try and craft the syllabus in such a way that it would provide meaningful and unique insights into each one of these specific things that we were interested in learning about meaning, value, governance, freedom, trust, censorship resistance, scaling, gift giving, there's lots of stuff. Uh, but it would do so as a means of springboarding into further conversation rather than providing one answer and then thinking that it was done. And that became our primary teaching method, right? It's, it's technically known as Socratic dialogue, which is a fancy way of saying really intentional talking and listening. Okay. Uh, and, and that is what we've done for more than three years now. And it has then acted in a feedback loop to consistently improve what we teach because inevitably as we enter into dialogue and what it means to enter into dialogue into, with another person is to open yourself up, right? To become vulnerable to who they are and what they hold and how they bring it to the moments of encounter. So inevitably in dialogue, you change, right? That's, that's what it means to try and follow the transformative learning environments. And so that has been, it's been really fascinating to watch it unfold. And it helps me answer like the goal, because even that word, it, it implies some telos, right? Some endpoints. It's like a teleological linear process from like, this happened, then this, then this, and this, and one day we'll like take over education in Web3. And that's like, not at all what we're really interested in. The kernel began as a gift to a friend. It was surprisingly successful. It was surprisingly well-timed. We had no intention of it, but we were ready and launched just as COVID hit in February, 2020. And so every, the world was locked down and everybody was like, oh, what now? And we were like, well, <laughs> we happen to have an online course. Why don't you come and join us, right? And I was like, very lucky. What we're primarily interested in is in this transformative process rather than any particular kind of end goal. You know, we have no desire to be the Khan Academy of Web3 or the Harvard of Web3, any of this kind of stuff. It's not at all what we're interested in. What I am most fundamentally interested in is can healthy, wholesome, and wise patterns of learning from one's peers be propagated throughout the ecosystem? Because again, if the goal of Ethereum is to collaborate on a global scale such and craft incentive structures that move value to people at the edges doing the actual work, we have to be able to learn from each other. Right? It's no good if everybody only learns about stealth addresses from Vitalik. Now, it's wonderful that Vitalik has a blog and that he does such incredible work. Truly, I've learned more from Vitalik.ca than most anywhere else on the internet. But if we're really talking about planetary scale civilization, global coordination, it can't rest on him. And it can't rest on any one of us. That's, that's the whole point. These, th these patterns, these open source protocols are what we need in order to really scale culture in ways that doesn't make it dogmatic, that doesn't impose onto local contexts, universal solutions, that rather holds different solutions up such that people in their contexts can apply them in ways which are specific and particular and nevertheless resonate with some kind of universal understanding of what good is or what beauty is without that becoming dogmatic and impositional, right? Like it's those days are past. We really hope, <laughs> you know, it's obviously always a little shadow to work through, but that's certainly what, what I hope, right? It's like, how, how do we learn how to learn from one another, really, in lasting, ongoing ways? Can we use the so-called trustless medium to find the trust in one another that is the root of real faith? You know, you see it in Lord of the Rings. It's a random tangent, but like it really illustrates this final point, which is that the Lord of the Rings is like a fundamentally Catholic work. Tolkien was, was Catholic, but there's no God and you don't see anybody ever praying or anything. 
it's all about the fellowship, right? As long as the fellowship remains true, because when we have faith in one another, what do you really have faith in, in the other, if not the reflection of your own light, right? And what is your own light? Do you really own it? <laughs> Does it own you? That's, you know, like, that's the, that's what makes that story so beautiful, because it's not about conquering or overcoming or, you know, implementing the Shire network states all over Middle Earth, right? It's about giving back. <laughs> it's about giving back the evil that doesn't belong in this world. And it is done through a fool's hope and a belief in fellowship, right? A faith in one another. Can we use a trustless medium to find the trust to really have faith in one another? That's the, there's like the paradox, right? The really beautiful paradox that these technologies put to us. It's up to us whether we take it up or not. I'm so glad you're making this reference now to Tolkien and the fellowship because it's, I have a really strong connection with it as well. And um, when we started the Common Ground project, we called the initial team the fellowship because we were just, you know, a bunch of people, uh, some of them not even knowing each other uh, for a very long time, but all sort of joined by this really hopeful mission to bring a gift to this world. And, uh, you know, marching into the unknown together and just full of hope that this would lead to, you know, something worthwhile, uh, not just for us, but for, you know, hopefully many, many more people. And so, yeah, I feel very much uh, in resonance with this and also, um, sort of a tangent, but it seems related is this idea of stigmergy and stigmergic wisdom. Um, you've just mentioned, you know, how can we sort of enable people to learn from each other, but in their specific local context. And, uh, it seems like this, this concept of stick mergy, which I would love for you to explain to our listeners, um, plays a significant role in this. Would you agree? And, and, you know, how would you contextualize this in this specific way? Stigmergy is a term that comes mostly from biology and mostly from the study of ants. And what it has to do is with how we leave lasting marks in environments such that we can coordinate without any central authority. So the ant colony will, you know, everybody wakes up in the morning, have a cup of coffee, greet the wife and kids, and then, you know, get out into the field, go looking for food. And all the ants act as little automatons and they move out in their own unique direction without, you know, orders from headquarters. <laughs> and they leave little pheromone trails, right? And then when one finds a uh, food source, he picks it up, brings it back to the nest, leaving another kind of pheromone trail, which tells other ants that might cross that path, hey, there's food that way, right? So you leave these lasting marks in the environment, which enable coordination across time. One of the ways in which I think about organization generally, but specifically, educational endeavors is in line with hospitality, right? Like, like how do we have hospitable organizations where the idea is to issue functional invitations to people, right? Like invitations to functional spaces, basically like places where think like where things are happening. This can be a mural board. It can be a contract safari on ether scan that we then take over to death or remix. It can be, you know, like a podcast studio. It can be a fig jam. It can be a mirror board. It doesn't, there's lots and lots of different creative spaces, right? Each of which is context specific, but there's a functional invitation to creative space where you can leave lasting marks about what you learn. Those lasting marks eventually percolate through collective knowledge, i.e. there's lots of people using this board or there's lots of people looking at the nouns contracts because they're a really good instantiation of NFTs combined with an interesting governance mechanism forked from compound. We can learn a lot of stuff about that. And then those lessons percolate down into the community. We build a collective wisdom about what kinds of patterns are really wholesome and what the effect of those things are in the world. And then those get represented in like public interfaces, which invite more people into the functional spaces that help them to learn from what others have been learning. That shared learning percolates down into collective wisdom. The collective wisdom gets put back into public interfaces. And this really means flywheel for wise collaboration based primarily on functional invitations, i.e. 
you're really careful right about like who you invite and to where right it's not just oh like come and join my zoom room and we'll kind of hang out no no like there's some you're a party host right when you host the party you think very carefully about where are you going to put the food and where are you going to put the punch and how are you going to mix the punch and what you're going to put in it and like i have a little bit of water by the dance floor so that people don't get too dehydrated you think carefully about the music but also there's a sense of flow and flexibility and if somebody wants to put on their own playlist at a particular point in the night that's kind of cool and you know your role as host is to welcome people well to introduce them to one another to orient them toward one another rather than to yourself a party which is only about the host is fundamentally boring right? terrible uh and 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 to be caretaker steward or maintainer of the space and that means like you know shepherding it back to public interfaces you know this is this is the way that we think about this rather funny words stigmaty uh but really it's just about like how can we invite people to places where they can leave meaningful traces that over time will help other people learn and improve their ability to find nourishing avenues and cut down the kinds of dead ends that they might need to explore before doing that right so over time we become increasingly wise and collaborative because we know that oh along this path there is there's nourishment to be found there's things to be done whereas walking down you know this particular one i can smell the pheromone trail and it doesn't necessarily lead anywhere that i want to be well andy this has been such a fascinating conversation i could continue this for hours because the way you talk the way you share your wisdom is just you know not only informative it's also poetic so thank you so much for sharing now maybe sort of a last question we're currently you know undergoing uh, uh sort of a face change i feel in this web3 ecosystem there is you know a lot of people who were active in the last so-called bull market i think have left the space because they sort of lost hope um there are maybe new people coming in because there is opportunity for them what is sort of the you know key insight or key learning that you would like to share with people who are just starting to discover this web3 space and the communities within it the values that it wants to embody what is your maybe key key learning or key thing that you would like them to to discover when they discover or listen to this podcast be honest you know that's it's the thing you know to really encounter somebody who's as much as is possible for them in that moment being honest is deeply attractive in ways which we still don't fully understand and it is the single thing which will help you find the others who are like you and forge the kinds of relationships which will last you through the inevitable changes of this world right web3 is particularly volatile and it changes all the time it teaches all of us very deep lessons about impermanence <laughs> i'll just leave that much and the way that we not only survive that find joy and meaning in it is through one another it's through the others it's through the relationships that you form and so it's not just you know the tim leary find the others good luck the way that you do that is honesty honesty is just the most valuable currency over long time horizons over the kind of time horizons that blockchains actually instantiate be honest and you'll see all of your despair all of the things you have thought forgotten all of the things you've been forced to put down by this life and see them resurrected by the phoenix <laughs> in ways you can never even begin to imagine i think this is really good advice thank you so much and i can only confirm this um and it took me many years i think to make progress on this actually myself um, so i i can it resonates deeply with me what you're saying thank you so much andy for finding common ground with me today <laughs> this was really uh a right um and uh i think i will listen to this many many times to really actually understand all these hints that you left and uh we will try to leave uh, as many of the book recommendations and you know names that you were sharing uh in the in the description to this to this podcast and i hope that it serves many many people on 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 the long time horizon as a starting point to get more deeply familiar with the with the topics that you're mastering so thank you very much for being with us today it's been a true pleasure and honor 
Thank you. Thank you.